joining us. As they said, I'm Catherine. I'm a researcher at the Crypto Research and Design Lab. And my the, the work of uh, Cradle is to put humans at the center of crypto. And my research is focused on understanding what is Web3? How is it shaping the industry and the future of tech? Um, I love Startup Boston. I went to MIT and used to go to events all the time. So I'm so, so glad to be able to contribute to this event. Um, and I'm so excited to be joined by our amazing panelists today. Uh, Katie, do you want to go ahead and kick us off with introductions? Sure. Hey, everybody. Uh, sorry, I'm not on video. I am up in Vermont and my Wi-Fi seems to be, uh, you know, only doing audio today. So apologies. Normally I would be in person, but um, my name is Katie. I work at Pillar VC. We are a pre-seed and seed stage venture firm based in Boston. Um, about a third of our fund is dedicated to crypto and Web3. And we invest kind of in a number of different industries within Web3, um, whether it's infrastructure or layer one technology, um, consumer technologies, et cetera. Uh, some of our big portfolio companies in Boston that you might recognize are Algorand and Circle um, and a bunch of other great companies as well. Um, and then we also run a collective called The Melon. Um, it's for uh, creating Web3 companies and crypto companies from scratch. So we work to come up with ideas and we'll recruit teams uh, to come and build those companies with us. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that if uh, anyone's interested. But that is me in a nutshell. Amazing. Phil, do you want to go ahead and go next? Sure. Hey, everyone. I'm Phil McManus. Great to meet everyone. Uh, co-founder and COO of Wave. We are a Web3 company focused on uh, being able to be able to store and share consumer data using the blockchain. Um, can talk a little bit more about that along the way later. Uh, my background has been at the intersection of product and technology. I am actually, I know a lot of people here are here to learn about Web3. Um, the majority of my experience has actually been in the Web2 world. So I've previously been through building and scaling a number of Web2 businesses. Um, you know, as you talk to Web3 people, People, you will hear them say at some point, I went down the rabbit hole and I bought into this is where the world is going. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very much in that, uh, you know, in that space and that mindset right now and really excited to just, uh, you know, share everyone a little bit about how uh, I got into Web3, where I think things are going and, uh, you know, why it's a really excited space to be involved in. Totally. I mean, the space is so new. I think all of us are a little bit new to the space, which is why I think it's a great group of folks to talk about for folks in the audience how to get into Web3 as you're coming from Web2, which is really what a lot of Startup Boston, what that audience looks like. Uh, Quadri, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Quadri Ogunthade is my name. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Trust Finance. What we are building with Trust Finance is real-time crypto payroll payments, benefits, and accounting solution for businesses, for DAOs who want to use crypto uh, to attract and retain talent. Uh, before this, I worked at, as the CEO and co-founder of Novostack, which was a talent organization, uh, you know, uh, training people on how to actually move from Web2 to Web3. And I also have background in, in product and tech. Amazing. Oh, I'm so excited about this group. So I think kind of just to kick us off, Web3 has a bunch of different, you know, definitions that get thrown onto it in various places, right? We're rebuilding the internet, as folks say. But we've got so many different backgrounds on this panel, like VCs, founders for more enterprise solutions, for more um, sort of consumer facing solutions and community development. And so I'm curious uh, for each of you, like what does Web3 mean to you and what makes you excited about Web3? I think, uh, Phil, if you want to go ahead and kick us off, I know that. Yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead and kick it off. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is really an interesting angle of Web3 is, is the concept of ownership. Um, and I guess I'll, you know, use one of the sort of, uh, I guess, you know, parallels that gets drawn is, is some people in Web3 talk about how Web3 compares to Web2. Um, you know, when you look at Web3 things, right, it's much more you're you're always paying a company to have access something or to get a thing, right? Um, the money goes to that company, they get the money, you get the service, and that's it. What's a little bit different in Web3 is there's, in a lot of projects, there's a concept of ownership where um, it's more as you're, you know, buying a, a cryptocurrency or a token or, you know, you look at sort of DAO and how DAOs work. Uh, it's really a lot more about having, uh, you know, whether you look at it as a 
a piece of the pie or a seat at the table, right? It's about being able to have the people that are participating in uh, a portion of the internet service, whatever it is, also be, um, whether it's, you know, ownership, have partial ownership, be able to have say, be able to have influence. Um, and even if it's not ownership, I think, you know, community is such a big piece, uh, which I think, um, you know, some other people will certainly talk about, but it's really about having a seat at the table instead of just giving money for a service and walking away and that's it. I think this is, I want to make sure we're getting a little bit deeper here, actually, because this ownership piece is really core to the value proposition of Wave, as I understand it. Can you talk yeah. maybe a little bit how, uh, consumer data and the way Wave handles it in Web3 is different than how it would be handled in Web2? Sure. So, you know, one of the things that's very different about we handle things in, in the Web3 space is that, um, I guess, you know, compared to Web2, right, there's generally data is siloed, it's closed away, it's generally on uh, unencrypted systems, to use the example, I'm sure it's, it's the engineering track, right? A lot of people know that data is generally stored in SQL databases, right? Um, they're unencrypted. You get an admin key, you are into it, you have access to everything, right? That's how a lot of these data breaches happen. Um, you know, what's really cool around some of the stuff they're doing with Wave in terms of leveraging blockchain and Web3 technology is that when, when we're storing data, there's sort of two components what we're doing in the Web3 space. One is uh, we take the data consents around how businesses are able to use uh, consumer data, we store that publicly on the blockchain so that there's a record. And really what that means is that if anything needs to be audited at some point in time, right, there's a public record of what occurred, albeit anonymous. Um, the other big angle of what we do is that we encrypt consumer data so that every single consumer record is individually encrypted and using cryptography and private keys. That's another big thing that as you sort of go down Web3, you'll hear a lot of stuff around keys and key management and cryptography. Um, um, you know, it's really interesting that, you know, the way that you can do some things is that every record on our platform gets its own unique encryption key. So heaven forbid a key is ever compromised, it stops at one user's data, right? It is mm -hmm. not, oh, hey, there was a data breach and somehow someone got access to 100 million records. It's one record and it stops there. So um, a lot of really cool stuff with the type of technology that's being developed. That's awesome. I'm really excited for us to dig in a little more to sort of how the security space, especially between Web 2 and Web 3, might play into it. But a lot of what you're talking about, right, is decentralization. I know Quadri, a couple of the projects you've worked on, and we've talked about how decentralization is a big part of your Why Web 3 story. Yeah, for me, definitely. And I think that decentralization, you know, really um, cuts across different aspects. Uh, for me, um, I can say like the the technology itself, which when you say Web3, right, we can look at blockchain, which you know, in a way you can define it as a peer-to-peer -peer network. Part of it is also the cryptography, but part of it is also the peer-to-peer -peer network of how you know, information and data is stored within the, within the blockchain and the technology itself. And if you go beyond that, there are use cases that focus on decentralization. So you have decentralized finance, for an example, where you know, moving from the traditional finance, where you have to set up an account with a bank, traditional bank, you have to go through all of the you know, KYC credit check, you have to submit application. With decentralized finance, right? You just need to have an internet connectivity. You are, you know, you have a wallet address and you can get access to financial service. I think that's a game changer. So it does not really matter where you are in the, in the world, right? This whole aspect of being decentralized where you could be in India, you could be in Nigeria, you could be anywhere. As long as you have internet connectivity and you have access to a wallet, you can actually get access to financial service. I think one of the things that we are passionate about trust finance is this, right? Where we can, you know, bring access to opportunities and ownership, which Phil mentioned, through in, in a much decentralized way by providing opportunity for people to join DAO, but also get paid using crypto. I think that's a, oh, is my video still there? Yes, yes. Okay, great. I think that's such a great point, especially because a lot of the applications of Web3, I mean, Phil really talked about sort of the technical side, how cryptography is different, but Quadri, what you're talking about is how use cases, they're not just sort of like shiny tech things. It's really about using technology to reform systems and structures that keep people from getting access. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people find really exciting about Web3. But Katie, I know that you kind of take a different approach to Web3, especially in your role as the director of platform at Pillar. Can you talk a little bit more about what Web3 means to you and to Pillar more broadly? Yeah, for sure. So I think, um, you know, 
one of the things you hear a lot, and, and as Quadri just mentioned in crypto, is decentralization. And decentralization is super important. And if you think about why, it's because, you know, in, in Web2 and in instances like Facebook or Instagram or some of the social networks, for example, uh, you know, you're the one doing all the work, creating all the content. And Facebook is the one, make or Meta, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, is the one making all of the money off of that. Um, and so, you know, Web3 to me is really about giving power back to the people. Um, and in order to decentralize, you really need those humans. You need that community to exist. And so um, a big thing that we're focused on at Pillar is building community, whether it's helping our portfolio companies build community in, you know, for their Web3 applications or whether it's in-person community, you know, for us to help find new companies to invest in, to help find experts, to help our portfolio companies answer questions, um, that kind of thing. Uh, but I think it all kind of goes back to that idea of decentralization is that you really need a community of people who are not only participating as community members, but also kind of to Phil's point, having ownership and being able to have full control over the decisions that we're make, you know, that they're making or that the community is making. And so I think one of the, the ways community plays uh, a big role in Web3 is through governance um, and kind of what that means is uh, for, you know, and I'm. I know some people are familiar, but for those who aren't, um, is any DAO or project or Web3 company often has a community which they go back to to ask questions about the future of their DAO project company. Um, and so being able to vote as a community member on those things about the future of a project um, is really a cool new paradigm of Web3. And, and that's something, you know, Pillar's really excited about and I'm personally really excited about as well. Katie, can you talk a little bit more about what a DAO is? Sure. Uh, so a DAO is a, it stands for a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, and thanks, Michelle, I just saw you, you put that in the chat. Um, it basically functions a lot like a company, um, except it's completely decentralized. And so unlike a company where you have to apply to be an employee, uh, and you have, you know, someone has to hire you and you have to come in, DAOs are oftentimes what they call um, you know, permissionless. So you can join the company, you can join the decentralized organization, and you can just start participating. Um, and sometimes it often looks like a Discord channel where people are working on different projects, and you can just raise your hand and say, hey, I want to help work on X, or I want to help work on Y. Um, and there are DAOs working on a number of different things, everything from, you know, tackling climate change to, uh, you know, building new financial uh, infrastructure and everything like that. But really, it's just a new uh, structure for a company in Web3 that's decentralized, doesn't have a CEO at the helm, but really has like a core team who's um, pushing, you know, whatever they want forward. What I love about what you said, Katie, is there is kind of a Web3 for everything. And since it's so much about a community first approach, I think a huge thing that I hear often is that Web3 is where people go to find their people, other people who are concerned about the same topics they're interested in and are interested in finding ways that technology can help them solve those problems. But I know everyone's journey to Web3 is a little bit different. Like for some people, it starts from like, I heard about it in the news or the speculation. And I'm sure everyone in the audience has their own understanding of what Web3 is to start. But I'd love to hear each of your stories about how you got into Web3. Um, why make the jump from Web2 in the first place? Uh, Quadri, do you want to go ahead and kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. I can, I can, I can start with that. So I first got into the space uh, around 2017 when CryptoKitties first came out. And you know, I played the game. I, I fell in love. I was like, this is really amazing. And then one, 20, can you one quick question? Can you elaborate on what CryptoKitties are? Yeah, so CryptoKitties is like uh, a project made by um, I believe it's Dapper Lab. I think I'm, maybe I'm missing that right now, but but it's it's actually like a, a, a NFT based game, which was like one of its version then where you can actually like you know you know create your own uh, kitties, right? You know NFT kitties, and then like you can actually use it on the game. And I think you know that was like the I, I would say the four mainstream application of 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 of, you know, of blockchain and you know also like integrating it with gaming right and i think i had a lot of widespread adoption then and then 2018 there was the whole ico you know initial coin offering um you know craziness for me also i actually also created my own coin 
And I was like, you know what? I'm going to create my own coin and actually just like, you know, send it to people, to people to use. And, you know, I learned a lot from there, learning how to actually write Solidity, you know, you know code and really creating a coin. So that was also very interesting. I was like, what's this new thing, right? Like you can create your own coin, you can be your own economy, right? So <laughs> so I got, I, I fell in love with that. And after then I started joining different DAOs that Katie mentioned, DAOs and Discord community, just to kind of learn more about what this technology is all about and really, you know, find people who are building. And now naturally uh, what also got me really even much more interested is really participating in a lot of hackathons. So after joining different DAOs, I saw that there were areas where you know, new products, new ideas, and, in, you know, new applications needs to be built, right? So, you know, joining, joining hackathons really gave me the opportunity to see what builders, what people are doing building, and where the opportunities are. And actually, that's how Trust Financial actually came into being. It was actually a first project through the, an hackathon that we won, and then, you know, kind of turned that into a startup. I am the biggest hackathon fan in the world. I don't know if the folks on this call know it, actually, but... Um, Cradle, in partnership with Coindesk and Hacker Earth, just finished up web 3 thon which is the largest multi-chain hackathon in the industry. And my first set of research on how crypto products get built is about the role that hackathons play. And so for the engineering track, I'm pretty certain that many of you have known about hackathons or participated in them even, but hackathons in Web3 are a totally different ballgame. Uh, Cradle has a whole report on hackathons if you're curious about the role they play in the space, so shameless plug for me. <laughs> um, but I think it's a really great point, Quadri, that when you're talking about the journey from, like your your first exposure to Web3 was about the first sort of mainstream use case, right, through CryptoKitties. And I think we're seeing like in the bear market as people get more focused on building the importance of those, of that utility. Um, so I think that's something useful for the folks, uh, you know, in the audience to keep in mind. Um, Katie, I'm curious about you though, especially from like a more community perspective rather than like a, a company building perspective. How'd you get into Web3? Sure. Yeah. So um, I joined Pillar in 2018 and my very first uh, assignment, I guess you could say, when uh, I joined was to run um, Boston Blockchain Week, which was a week long conference. Um, and it was really to celebrate the blockchain and crypto innovation that was happening here in Boston, uh, coming from the universities and, and companies like, you know, Algorand and Circle. Um, and prior to that, I had really never heard of crypto or blockchain. And, uh, you know, my team was just like, yeah, you'll be fine. You'll learn it. Go for it. Um, and and I did. And I think that's like one of the things that I took away was like I was super new running this, you know, new to the industry, running this conference. Um, and I had to get up to speed really quickly on, you know, who are the important speakers in the space? What are these, what do these people like even like to talk about? I had no idea. Um, but the community was just so welcoming. And as a newbie, people were psyched that new people were coming into the space because they knew that that meant that there were going to be more applications being built and more communities being developed and things like that. So, um, yeah, after that, I was kind of hooked and I've been in the space since um, and just continued to build different communities uh, within the, the blockchain and crypto ecosystem. Putting together a conference in Web3 is truly a trial by fire to make sure that you're getting into the space <laughs> as quickly as possible. So huge ups to you for pulling that together. One thing I'm curious about as kind of a follow up is conferences actually play like a really huge role in yeah. getting into the space. Like you were saying, like they're, they're really and something that I think wasn't so much the way in Web2 before the advent of social media. There are actually like real influencers in the space that inform mm -hmm. and provide thought leadership about the direction the industry is growing. What yeah. did you find from running this conference was the biggest thing people were hoping to get out of it? Like, What are the sorts of people who showed up and why did they go? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting point is, uh, you know, one of the, the pros and cons, I will say, of crypto and Web3 is that it's global. And so that's amazing because you can have talent and people working on similar problems from all over the globe. Uh, but at the same time, that means it's 24 seven, you know, 365. And that can be pretty exhausting. And so I think 
uh, why this community loves getting together in person so much is because it's everybody from all over the world, all in one place at one time. And you can brainstorm, uh, you know, hack on things together. And also, it's just fun. It's like very fun to be in person and, and you know, have a party and, and whatnot, <laughs> um, you know, bounce ideas off of each other. But for this specific conference, it was a lot of um, students, actually, MIT, Harvard students that were looking to just learn about the technology and about the industry. Um, and at the time, it was, you know, 2018, crypto has been around for longer than that, but it was still fairly new. And so it was kind of around the same time as, as the ICO boom, as you were mentioning, Quadri. So a lot of people just looking to learn, like, uh, what are the benchmarks in this space for a number of different reasons? Like, how should I raise money? How should I hire talent? How should I, um, you know, build my company? And at the time, there weren't there just weren't as many opportunities to kind of get that, that information because it was so new. And it was a lot of knowledge kind of passed down from person to person uh, instead of now you can go online and just, you know, read blog posts and things like that. And not that that didn't exist back then. It was just newer. Um, so I think that's that's really what people were looking to get out of this conference at the time. Totally. I think the space is moving so quickly that even conference to conference, what people are looking to get out of it changes by geography, by who's running it, by audience. Um, and before we jump to Phil and his journey to Web3, I'm wondering for folks in the audience who are going to, because this you know, panel is going to go so well, everyone's going to be like, man, how do I get more involved in Web3 in Boston or wherever I am? Do you know of any resources that you'd recommend for people who are looking to learn more or find out about these events apart from like, scrolling through Eventbrite or getting an email to their mailing list in school. <laughs> yeah. It's time for the shameless plug for the Boston Dow. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Phil. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll drop this into the, the chat as well. Um, so there is a Dow in Boston called the Boston Dow. Um, right now it is, we're, we're working on formalizing the organization as a DAO with proper structure behind it. Um, it's, uh, primarily right now a telegram group of about 400 people. For those who don't know, telegram is sort of the messaging application that, uh, you know, that the crypto sphere has gravitated towards. Um, but I'll drop the handle, uh, on to, I'll drop the Twitter handle into the chat as well as the website would really encourage anyone who's interested in getting into web three to, you know, come join an event, follow us on Twitter. Uh, we're really just about fostering web three community in Boston. You know, one of the things that earlier this year, uh, a handful of people determined was you look at people like, well, where should we go to start a crypto company? And you hear things like New York or Miami and San Francisco and not Boston, which just doesn't make any sense because we've got some of the most amazing tech talent in the world. Um, you know, we've got highly successful companies that, you know, like Katie mentioned Circle, right? The leading stable coin in the world is a Boston company. Why is there not more of that innovation happening here? So we're here to really help make that happen. Totally. I think that's one of the magical things about decentralization, like Katie had said, um, is that you've got people from all over the world working on it. So when we talk about Web2 and how you know, Silicon Valley was really where all the commercial applications of the research that was happening mostly on the East Coast sort of came to be, like starting all the way from the advent of the semiconductor to providing applications for computing um, and software development. But since we're moving towards a more decentralized world and the increased prevalence of remote work, we really see the opportunity for innovation to come from anywhere and these micro communities having as much of a, like, of a spot on the playing field as anyone else um, as we're moving away from sort of a campus culture. Um, but I mean, Phil, this is a great segue to you because I know that your journey was very much one from Web 2 to Web 3. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about what that was like? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's it's really interesting. Uh, and, and by the way, if anyone's another great way to get involved with Web 3 is, you know, we we're talking about conferences, right? Um, going to a conference is such a great way to start to understand what's going on at Web3, talking to people about how they get into Web3 and their stories. Um, I'll sort of, my story actually goes all the way back to probably about 2012, 2013, um, when, you know, I initially heard about Bitcoin and I was, you know, early on was like, I see where this is going. This is a really cool idea. Uh, set up my computer to start mining Bitcoin and did the math on, is it even going to cover the electricity? Literally built it all out was about to hit the go button and said, you know, I'm going to be lucky to break even on the electricity that it's going to cost to mine this to try this out. And um, 
you know, didn't think anything about the potential upside in, in growth and value of Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, a lot of early, you know, a lot of people who sort of early took a look at it, have stories like that. I know a number of people who uh, actually had Bitcoin and along the way were like, oh, I'm going to use it to, uh, you know, buy a wedding ring, sell a house, do these things and sort of joke that like, wow, that's one of the world's most expensive wedding rings because I used it to, <laughs> you know, I bought it with Bitcoin back in like 2014. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I've sort of always been following following this space. Um, I was looking at the different sort of cryptocurrencies, but, you know, mainly it was more sort of from the outside and as a hobby, sort of just staying aware of it. Um, where I really jumped in was over, you know, maybe the last couple of years, it's clearly been picking up. It's become about more than just the concept of cryptocurrencies. There's been a lot of technology innovation. There's been a lot of things around decentralized technology. And, uh, you know, the, the way I got involved with Wave is um, uh, my co-founder had an idea of, you know, being able to deal with the challenges around storing data consents and proof of opt-in, right, for, you know, marketing, right? Boston, big MarTech, uh, you know, big MarTech area in terms of uh, you know, technology and businesses. So hopefully some people in the, in the crowd understand that. And, you know, the idea was, well, if, if, you know, blockchain provides this public ledger, right, of proof that something occurred, isn't that the type of thing that would be great for data consent and having proof that a consumer opt in to receiving emails, text messages, data sharing. Um, and what was actually really interesting about it is, uh, you know, when, when he told me about the idea, I was like, it's a really good idea, but someone's got to already be doing this, right? This is like the type of thing that blockchain was made for. And as we took a look at it, you know, when uh, we started talking about the sort of last year was doing this research, previously, you would have required the only technologies that were out there that could do something like this were an Ethereum and without going too deep in the technology, um, you know, Ethereum was, was fairly slow. It could only handle, you know, maybe 100 transactions actions a second or hundreds of transactions a second, right? Um, but now as technology is developed, there's now high throughput technology that's out there that instead of being able to handle hundreds of transactions a second can handle thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of transactions a second. So that was really sort of what was an indication to me that there was interesting stuff going on in the space was the technology development was sort of starting to cross that chasm of being able to do more and have more interesting applications. So, uh, you know, that was where we set off on the, the voyage to build Wave and use Web3 decentralized technologies. Um, you know, it's been super interesting. It's, I think, one of the things that uh, you know, this is an engineering track, right? There's a lot of concepts that uh, a lot of people already know in Web2. So some different concepts like um, data sharding or clusters or nodes, right? For those of you who uh, on the engineering side know that, you know, with SQL, right, you have clusters of databases, right? Well, it's really the same type of thing in Web3 when you look at things like distributed networks. The difference is it's not five of your own private clusters in your own AWS, uh, you know, your own AWS environment. It's, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of nodes out there that are interconnected doing the same type of thing. So, uh, you know, it's a lot of the things that we've sort of built to scale in terms of Web2 technology, but that's where I talk about the ownership, right? It's not about the data being stored on your personal Web3, or sorry, your personal AWS instance that you've brought up inside Amazon servers. It's that anyone or different providers can be hosts or a part of that and have an ownership in the network. So uh, that's really where sort of this transition is starting to happen, right? So it's not like for anyone who's trying to get into the space, it's not like you need to learn something new from scratch that is completely unrelatable. It's a lot of the type of stuff that we all know, just thinking about it in a very different way and starting to just have a different lens and perspective on, you know, technology, how things work, economics, et cetera. Totally. I think one of the things I really like love and miss about Boston is there are a lot of really amazing engineers who just really love to nerd out about stuff in Boston. That's kind of everything that makes, you know, having a, like a college town, a university culture amazing. And there's so many amazing opportunities for students. I mean, your story about getting in, like, you know, buying the most expensive wedding ring ever. I don't know if anyone in the audience remembers when MIT gave everyone a $100 worth of 2018 Bitcoin and I bought Froyo from Cafe 472 and it was delicious, but not worth it. I mean, who doesn't love Kenmore Square, but oh my gosh, worst mistake of my life. Um, but like on the point of getting to conferences, like that's 
one of the types of opportunities that students get. But also if you're trying to go to conferences, there's often student discounts. Definitely see if your universities are offering opportunities about that to get into Web3. And the last thing that you were talking about, Phil, right? Like as much as blockchain is a, a headline and a column on a website and you know a trending tag on Twitter, really it's just a pretty neat data structure that you can do really cool stuff with to change how people interact with systems. And so I think if you want to take off your, you know, media hype glasses and think of it as a technology that has cool applications, like that's where things like hackathons become cool. That's where things like talking to VCs becomes meaningful because you can get past the hype towards actually thinking about what people need. But to that point, for a lot of people, Web3 really is, you know, like this crazy thing that their, their, their uncle heard about <laughs> that they talk about at Thanksgiving or whatever the case may be. And I think we actually have some real challenges in the industry that we're currently grappling with. And we're now in the time, you know, like Phil, as you were saying, to develop the infrastructure we need to move things forward, right? Like infrastructure has changed and we're kind of out of time to build, but there's still challenges ahead of us. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, Katie, maybe if you want to kick us off, what are the challenges that you see in Web3 happening today, maybe especially in the community building aspect? Sure. Um, there's so many. <laughs> there's a lot of challenges. <laughs> Also a lot of opportunities too. Um, I think the number one challenge is honestly adoption right now. Um, I would say that I, in my personal opinion, I don't think we found like the killer app and I'm doing air quotes. You can't necessarily see me. Um, <laughs> but that, you know, that has kind of made the masses understand and see the value in Web3. Um, I think NFTs were pretty close and kind of getting people excited about putting art or music on the blockchain. Um, but there hasn't been something yet that's made the majority of people understand like, wow, Web3 is a huge, you know, paradigm shift and I need to be in it right now. Um, I think something like 8% of people in, in the country in the US have used crypto. Um, but like how many of them are actually using that for something useful versus just like, you know, putting some money in Dogecoin just to see because, you know, they wanted to know. Um, so I think that's uh, that's a big part of it. And then um, I, I also just saw this question in, in the chat, but I think the other thing, you know, is the lack of developers um, in the space. And I think that's also hindering, you know, the lack of adoption too, because I think there are, you know, there's tens of millions of software developers in the world. Uh, and I think there's something only like 10,000 blockchain developers, or it's some like crazy statistic like that. Um, and if you think about it, like, okay, is the next killer app really gonna be come from the minds of 10,000 people? Like maybe, but more realistically, it's gonna come from the minds of tens of millions of people. And so I think we need to make it easier for developers to get into the space, you know, start building in this space, not have to understand like all of the little, you know, nitty gritty things about how the technology really works in order to start building applications on top of it. Um, and, you know, so I think I think that's kind of one of the biggest hindrances to ma mass market adoption as well is like we just need more people building cool stuff. Um, so those are two of the challenges I see um, and, and building a community of developers, you know, to your point, Catherine, about community building is also um, a big part of that. I so love that quote that the next like killer app is not going to come from 10,000 people. It's going to come from probably everyone else and maybe yeah. the people in this room, which is amazing. Um, and, I, and I will plug, I, I will just do a shameless plug for one of our portfolio companies, Reach, um, which is making it really easy for people to learn blockchain development. Um, they are based in Boston. The CEO, Chris Winner, is fantastic. And um, he's the one that kind of, uh, you know, gave me that statistic. So uh, definitely check them out. Totally. And Muthu, thank you so much for modeling this, but feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat. This session's really for all the folks in the audience, as much as I love talking to these people. Um, so be <laughs> sure to drop those questions in. Um, but Quadri, maybe you can jump in next about um, sort of challenges you're seeing in the space. I think especially your journey from, you know, the ICO boom towards this more like utility for helping companies applications, really interesting, maybe something you could speak to. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, Kitty has mentioned about adoption and about the lack of enough engineering talent. I think another big need in this space is really focusing on use cases um, that can really speak well to the regular uh, user, right? Like not like a crypto native, Web3 native, someone that understands the technical aspect of blockchain, but, you know, find, you know, simple use cases. And I think 
part of the gap here is that how can we actually bring on board a lot of people who understand how to build products that can actually go, that can have mass adoption, how to really identify, you know, specific customer need and use cases and build user experience that's easy to follow, where it's not like if you really need to download your wallet or you really need to make a transaction happen, you have to go through 10 steps, you have to store your secret key, you have to download. So all of that really add more friction to the whole experience and to the whole adoption, right? So I think the need here is like, we need to, you know, get more talented people that understand how to build products, understand how to build applications that solve real use cases. And there's tons of them, right? This is where there's a lot of opportunities, right? I think we haven't even scratched the surface yet in terms of the kind of application you can build using this technology and using blockchain. But yeah, really finding those people. And I think uh, for anybody who is really interested where you maybe identify a use case, you don't understand uh, the how to actually go about it. This is where the whole idea of you know going to hackathon, going to events. These are like ways you can do it. I think we really need a lot of people that are outside of the old bubble of Web three, where like oh I, I don't understand the text like that's very good, but you understand like oh there's a need that you want to solve, right? Can you actually then partner up with people who are building the space, who, who understand the technology to to get things done? And I think we will create more value and really also bring mass adoption uh, in, 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 into the space. I think the point about, oh, go ahead, Bill. I say, hey, Quadri, you absolutely hit the nail on the head there. I mean, that is that is one of the biggest challenges in the space right now, right, is, uh, you know, if there's any sort of, like, one learning that I have seen and heard at every single conference I have been to over the last year and what every VC or every sort of, you know, big figure in crypto has said is that the key to mass adoption right now is usability. Um, that's one of the things that we really need to work on. And notice that it was usability, not technology. It wasn't, we need a new language. We need another way of doing this. It's, we need people who are willing to take that step, right, from, from web two, come into web three and build usable products. I think, as Quadri said, that was really one of the big challenge with sort of where we're at is a lot of the people who have been building in web three recently are much more technology focused. And that doesn't always, well, that, you know, can create amazing technology, new possibilities, really cool stuff. It doesn't always align with the most usable product, right? Which is why we have getting a crypto wallet takes 10 steps. If you want to change one cryptocurrency to another current cryptocurrency, it goes through all these different processes. And it's like, oh, wow, I couldn't even get to where I needed to go, right? Um, so I think if you know, you're someone who's really passionate about trying to build new things and is able to really put your, you know, really put yourself in a mindset where you can have empathy for the customer and the end user. Um, those are really the type of people that we need to start seeing get into web three and bring those, you know, web two experience that that they've got. I sort of like to, to say a little bit with some of the technology that we're building, my solution to that, as I call it, web 2.5, and that it's all web three technology on the back end. We've got a version that if you want want to go full web three native and do everything in that way, go for it. But I just don't think we're there yet. So we created the sort of, we call a web 2.5 layer that makes it easier to use and get on and, and try things. Um, but I think that's really one of the big things that we need to work on is usability. Uh, Can I really go on if possible? Yeah, Catherine. So quickly, I, I want to also like make sure I add this so that we don't, uh, I think regulation also and regulate clarity in regulation is also very important. And I think there's been a lot of progress towards it, you know, you know, recently from what was released by the uh, you know, White House. But I think more needs to be done around regulation clarity, right? Because what that does for a lot of, you know, potential businesses or, you know, people that really want to get into the space is to understand that there's a guide rail, there's a set of rules that I can follow to make sure I'm, I'm being compliant and I'm, I'm not, you know, breaking the law, right? So I think if we can add better regulation clarity also, I think that could really help the space. Absolutely. I mean, I think I think actually the point you just said about regulation clarity and user experience are kind of the same, right? What we need in the space is smart people who can translate between this technical jargon, whether it's legalese or, you know, solidity, <laughs> and put it into something that people who actually use products can use. Cradle actually just released a report on user experience and cryptocurrency. So if we're talking about like, oh, bridging my wallet between like wrapped ETH and regular ETH to buy an NFT is something that's a huge pain in the butt. And you're like, what? 
this is a great report for you to take a look at to get a sense of sort of what some of those landmines are. And one of my favorite quotes from it is um, like transparency isn't the same thing as trust. And the specific example is like my mom doesn't understand how an automated clearinghouse works. And she does not have to. Like, you don't need to understand all the mechanics of our current financial system to participate in it. And you shouldn't have to do that for Web3 either, even though the transparency is something that really makes it different, right? The ability to contribute and own. But on that point of UX and uh, sort of translation, I mean, one of the things that I think the folks in this room are eager to hear about, though, if you have more questions, drop them in the chat, is what are the skill sets that we're really missing in Web3 today? Um, and where are the opportunities for me to take, like, I'm a PM, I'm a front end dev, I'm a back end dev, I do UI, UX. Like, what what do companies need? Probably all those things, but not to take other people's words. Bill, do you want to go ahead and kick us off? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's funny you said not to say all those things, because I was going to say, yeah, no, all, all of those things. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been funny as I've been talking with, uh, you know, the people at the, um, I'm actually uh, down, if I didn't say already, I'm down in New York this week for the Masari Mainnet Conference. Uh, Masari is a, a crypto research firm, um, and there's a lot of people down here. And some of the takeaways that there's sort of, it's, it's literally across the board, right? It's everything. I think, uh, you know, one engineering and, and engineers who have taken the time to learn uh, you know, solidity is sort of the standard for EVM. If you want to be more forward thinking and you want to think about where things are in the future, um, you know, Rust is becoming a very popular language for building on smart contracts. Um, I think there's also potentially a really big opportunity coming up learning Move. So Aptos and Sui are two new layer ones that are coming out that are starting to get, uh, you know, a lot of visibility around them was actually talking with uh, Sui a little bit this morning. Um, there's some really interesting things coming up. So I think, you know, on, on the engineering side, uh, definitely is a big gap. I think the other big gap is really on the product side, as we were talking about right around the usability, UX, UI, uh, very much needed in Web3 at this point. And, you know, the other one I think that's pretty big as well is recruiting. If you're a recruiter, I've got a, a good friend that I've been trying to like get him to jump over into Web3. And he's sort of, uh, I know we've got sort of later, but some of his questions are like, well, is this really a risky space, right? Like what's going on? You know, I got him to come out with me last night. He's like, no, this is this is interesting. He's like, there's actually like very real things happening here. So um, yeah, I'd say, you know, tech, uh, you know, engineering is a big one. UX, UI, and I think recruiting as well, because the recruiting is what's really going to solve a lot of all of that. So that those is some of my thoughts. That's amazing. I've never heard anyone bring up the point that recruiting is, first of all, like a skill set in tech. Like, I think that's something that people in tech don't talk about a lot. Like, my best friend is a technical recruiter, and she's amazing. And just because she can't code doesn't mean she's not important to the tech industry. <laughs> so I love that you brought that up. Um, but I'm curious, other folks, you know, Katie, Quadri, are there other skill sets that you're seeing um, that you want to add on? Quadri, you can you can go first. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, for me, yeah, I think the product, the technical, the recruiting. One thing that is very unique about Web3 that, you know, Katie mentioned about community, right? I think for a product person, one of the things that you also have to really learn, and maybe this also kind of requires cross collaboration uh, across different um you know, different work stream or different, different function, which as a product manager you should be able to handle, is how do you build a thriving community? That requires a different kind of skill set, which in Web3 is very critical, right? So we need product people, but you also know that there are some things that you actually also need to really bring in that's very unique to the Web3 way of, you know, developing product community. How do you create incentives to actually encourage communities, you know, tokenization. So there's a lot of things, those nuances where, again, from a product point of view, we really need you to come in, but also know that there are some peculiar things that are very much Web3 that you also have to learn, or maybe you can, you know, bring from like, you know, what you've done in Web2. One thing I'm curious about, Quadri, for you specifically, just before we get to Katie, is so you'd worked on a token project before and then switched to something different. I'm curious, based on everything you learned from your token project, like are there skill sets you wish you'd had on that project to maybe inform how you approached building it or something like that? 
I don't know. It's kind of out of out of left field. Like, <laughs> no, are coming up with yeah. doubt and stuff like that. It's a great kind yeah. Of I think well, one thing I would say with token and tokenization is like token design is very difficult, <laughs> and it requires a skill set that is not just like you launching a token or you just creating a token. It's like it's so much. A culture creates so much. Uh, you know, cross discipline, right? Thinking about you know economics, incentives, game theory, you know, technical product so there's so much right so th this is also where there's an opportunity there right so it's that's uh, the whole idea of community you know building as a community right where you are not just thinking like i I'm, i can code i can just do product but know that for you to be successful with what you're building in web3 or you know we also need people who understand you know game theory who understand economics who understand how to actually uh, create incentives and design incentive system you know system in you know design right so i think so again to go back i think Launching an ICO does not guarantee success in Web3, and launching a token does not guarantee success. So it's very important to understand that it requires different skill sets. And again, this is where the opportunity is, right? It's not just technical. You don't really also, you don't just have to know how to do solidity to be able to be able to contribute. Even if you, you know, you understand system thinking, you understand, you know, design thinking, there's a lot you can contribute to the space. Totally. I think one thing that I, you know, after running this hackathon that I've learned is that there's a real difference from like, conditioning and like doing push-ups and like playing on a sports team, right? Like learning solidity, doing a hackathon project to like diddle around and figure out how code works. That's one thing. But if you want to build an actual project, you need team members that have different skill sets than yourself. So, you know, my, my piece of advice for the engineers in the group is you don't have to maybe build fast and break things, but do at least with other people who can like fill in the gaps on helping you move faster on the stuff you might not be an expert in. Um, you don't have to be an expert in everything, especially in a space that's so new and moving so fast. Um, but Katie, I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I second everything that you all have said. I think the only thing I would add is uh, that I haven't heard mentioned yet is marketers um, and like branding professionals. I think UI, well, UI, UX, obviously product designers, yes. But I think like a lot of the projects and companies that we're backing are like, uh, you know, two engineers or a quant, you know, a quant trader and an engineer. And, you know, you look at the first version of their website and I don't think they would get mad at me for saying this, but you're like, I just, I don't know what this says. Like, I don't understand, <laughs> like does not compute in my brain. <laughs> so I think like people who are able to under, like take these deep technical uh, topics and turn them into marketing language and uh, things that the average user can understand um, is really important too. So um, marketers, you know, people who can create those one-page websites uh, in the early days of getting a company up to, you know, up to speed is uh, also a very important skill. Totally. I, uh, if, so just really quickly before I respond to that, if anyone has questions, we're sort of coming close to the last 10 minutes, so make sure you drop those in the chat. But it sounds like the real takeaway from that question was, well, if you have any skill sets, there's a spot for you in Web3. And 100%. Variety... <laughs> so make sure, it's like never been a better time to sort of get involved uh, and give it a try. And so with that in mind, we've talked a little bit about hackathons and DAOs, but let's say I come away from this panel uh, feeling like, oh, do we have a question in the audience perhaps? We do actually, funny enough. Sweet, let's take that one instead. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, this is this is Prakash Patel. Um, I have a small startup which, uh, which is based on low code and no code. But but, but I guess uh, if I may, there are two quick questions. Uh, one is, what's your view on? Um, I believe there's something called a hype cycle for any new technology. And as per Gartner, which is a research firm, uh, they claim that it takes ten years. Uh, so so just quickly, what do you th where do you think Web two is now currently? And then the second uh, and the second question is, I'm surprised that. Um, um, Actually, I'm not sure whether Phil, Phil or Quadri said that, but you, you mentioned that there is a lack of use cases. I'm, I'm very surprised on that one. But, but, but the question there is, uh, it's an interesting question for a decentralized decentralization technology. Who is responsible from the communities uh, for, for, uh, for interacting with the government to form regulations and so on and so on and so forth? Is there a body or is there an organization? Mm. So I'll, I'll actually start off first on your hype cycle question. Um, love the question because while I was uh, at the show yesterday, someone from Forbes actually came by and asked me that same question. Um, so I think, you know, my my response on that is, I, I think the, you know, the let's take a look at the 10-year the angle, right? 
Um, you know, really crypto started taking off with Bitcoin on sort of the really early followers, right, uh, about 10 years ago. So, uh, you know, when did it really start to take off more and move a little bit more mainstream? It certainly is a little bit further down. Um, and I think you'll also see that a lot of people talk about the crypto market tends to operate in cycles. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we've just gone through one, right, with what happened late last year coming into early this year. I think one of the things that I'm seeing more and more of, and, you know, maybe I'm a little self-selecting in this comment because I'm, I'm one of those people, but I'm seeing a lot of people move from Web 2 into Web 3 on the basis that they see enough things there. So um, I certainly don't think we're at the height, you know, the, the top of the hype, right? I think we're making our way there. But I think we're starting to go in the right direction because there's people from other places coming into to Web3. And I think that's one of my big takeaways from sort of what I saw happen late last year, early this year, is that Web3 needs to not be about a thing that sort of builds itself up and controls itself internally, that finds its place in the larger world, the larger economy, the larger ecosystem across communities, technologies, businesses, et cetera. And, and I think we're starting to get there. We're definitely not there yet, but I think we're starting to see some of those inklings. I don't know if others have thoughts, but that's sort of my my view. Yeah, I can, I can quickly jump in and just, I, I totally agree with you. I, I want to address the question of lack of use case. So actually, there's a lot of use case, right? It's not lack of use case. There's a lot of use case for Web3 and blockchain. I think what's missing is really understanding how you can take the, you know, the capabilities and the um, features that blockchain enables into those use cases, right? So in, in terms of insurance, for example, in terms of, uh, you know, personal finance, in terms of, uh, you know, so that it, it cut across a lot of industry. I think where the gap is, is that there are a lot of things that, you know, this technology can do, but finding people and finding people that understand how you can take the best of both or the, the best of what Web3 can offer and apply it into an application that can actually gain mainstream adoption is what's missing. Totally. Katie, I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah, I'd say um, the only that your second question was more about like uh, regulation and who like I don't necessarily have anything to add on the first question. I think you're, you're both spot on. We're still early and, and we're getting there um, to your second question about like regulation and, and who's responsible for uh, interacting with regulators. Um, I think it really depends. So in company, you know, in big companies like Circle or Algorand um, or a lot of other big crypto companies, like they have uh, a GC, like they have a general counsel, they have an entire legal team, they sometimes hire lobbyists, they um, have connections, you know, in Washington, and they're the ones doing the work along with the CEO. Um, and that's definitely more in like a traditional company structure. Um, I'd say in DAOs, it becomes a lot murkier of a topic, I think, um, because there's no true like CEO at the helm. Um, and so in some cases, I think they can create like, uh, you know, either sub DAOs or like smaller committees within a DAO of like lawyers or lobbyists that then are the ones kind of talking to regulators. In other cases, um, you know, there is a core team responsible for the DAO and they can be the ones talking to regulators. So um, it really depends, but I think uh, there's a ton of need for lawyers in this space as well. Um, and, you know, they're the ones that are getting hired to, to do the work um, with the regulators. Can I quickly add yeah. something to I'll, that? Yeah, yeah, oh. feel free. Oh, sorry. So quickly, so one thing I will also say is like, the builders, the Web3 builders also need to start telling their own stories. Because by the way, so, you know, we can go say lawyers and lobbyists, wherever, but I think also if you build good application that people find useful, that tells the stories. And like all of the regulators, a lot of times is we are trying to protect consumer, you know, do consumer protection, make sure, you know, people are not, you know, you know, using products that, you know, that, that, that is not great, right? So, but if you build great products, Right, and we tell our own story on the kind of impact we're making. I think that would drive a lot of you know, you know, good, uh, you know, regulation and, and policy towards this space. Yeah, I'll, I'll also add on the the you know regulation side. Um, 
you know, huge shout out to Kate Lipperger Median, who's uh, part of the state legislature. She took the time to actually uh, chat with Boston Dow, get some understanding of what we're trying to do and is trying to help the state legislature understand what's going on here. I mean, not to go on a, a tangent, right, but I think one of the things, if there's sort of anyone in the audience, right, who's trying to get their head around Web3, um, you know, one of the things that Massachusetts has talked about for decades has been the brain drain problem. Right. We have all this amazing technology talent, right, that comes to school in Boston, then goes other places. This is a great way that we can start to change and maintain that. But there needs to be an open conversation with the government, with the universities, with the community, with businesses. Right. Um, you know, I think there's a real interesting opportunity here from that standpoint. And uh, unfortunately, there isn't any one central place. Right. That's that's in charge of that. There's, you know, no specific policymaker. So uh, I think it's. It's about being able to have that open conversation and sort of look at where we're going with with that um, and just, you know, make sure that you're engaging. And like Audrey said, right, um, got to tell our stories and see that this is change that we want to see and help people understand what's being built and what's happening in this space. Totally. Um, so just one quick point on the hype cycle. I think that one thing that happens often in Web3 is people treat it like a monolith. I wouldn't say Web3 is all at the same spot in the hype cycle. I think that we could say that NFTs are at a different spot than DAOs, than, um, you know, refi, than uh, DeFi. And so pulling those apart when you're evaluating what project to pursue is something I would really recommend for folks. Um, but we're really coming up against time here. I think just sort of a lightning round, really quick, one sentence. Each of you, what is one piece of advice you have for people who are just getting into Web3? So if anyone feels ready, I know it was all of a sudden. <laughs> I would, I'll, I'll go for it. Oh, go for it, Katie. Sorry. Sure. I would say just get started. I think um, I know that's like sometimes easier said than done, but pretty tactically the way I did it was I just followed a bunch of crypto people on Twitter and I read what they were tweeting about and I clicked, you know, I saved a bunch of their tweets and I read them, you know, every night before bed. And I also looked in their bios and found what Discord communities they were part of and joined those Discord communities and started, you know, joining the, the conversation there. Um, and so, you know, it's pretty easy to just jump in and uh, and get started. And I think, like I, I think we mentioned this earlier, but this community is so welcoming to newbies because they want more people in this space with any sorts of skills. And so a lot of these communities also have, um, you know, a newbies channel or a Q&A channel. And you can say like, hey, what the heck does DAO mean? And they're like, oh, that's DAO. And we'll explain it to you. And so um, I think there's no stupid questions in this space. And people are really willing to help people out who are looking to get in, involved in any way. Um, and so I think the best piece of advice I have is just get going. Love that. Bill, 30 seconds, go. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I was going to echo a lot of, you know, what, what Katie just said, right? Um, I'd say just get out there, right? Talk to people, uh, you know, as, as much as um, you can certainly see what's going on on crypto Twitter, get on some discords, things like that. Um, if you know anyone who's doing things in Web3 or crypto, reach out to them, talk to them. They probably know about some things that are going on. Um, if you see, you know, comps or things like that happening in Boston, get, get out there. It's very much a... Uh, you know, as much as it's decentralized, right? And there's a lot of people sort of on their computers all the time. Man, Web3 and crypto people just flock to and love in-person events. Um, it's just a really big thing in the space, maybe because there's such a big gap on that, like, you know, sort of just always sort of being in the technology side of things and being decentralized. Uh, but if you have the chance to go get out there, talk to your friends, um, and, you know, there's just so much stuff going on in this space that I really think that's another great way to do it, is just sort of network through people you know and, and things like that. Totally. Quadri, take us home. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be quick. As a builder, I would say you cannot listen your way. You cannot read your way into Web3. Build. Join hackathons. Try to build something. Within your specific domain, try to build something. And you will learn so much. Even if you make mistakes, you will learn so much.